Hello, everyone. Welcome. My God, there are a lot of you. <laughs> Everybody still awake after the excellent lunch they serve here? Awesome. Well, I'm probably just napping, everyone. It's a bit hard to see there because uh, this is slide one of 384, so we're going to need the hour. <laughs> no, I'm just messing with you. There are less than 30 slides. Network Hacking 301. The previous 101 and 201 said basic networking, network hacks and countermeasures for educational purposes only. That one remained the same. This one is advanced networking, networks, hacks and countermeasures. The part that remains the same is the for educational purposes only. The previous presentation was fit for both network owners or people responsible for networking to make sure that what could happen on a certain type of network, what could happen, what should happen, and how to defend against the stuff that could happen that you don't want to happen. This one has a slightly larger audience, and I'm going to get there in a while. But first, a short recap. The Network Hacking 101. Like I said, the basic networking. I'm going to b go through the entire presentation very brief. There's a scenario. You go to the favorite coffee house. You connect to the wireless network and browse to Facebook. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> we talked about Wi-Fi pineapples. We talked about DNS uh, spoofing. We talked about ARP poisoning. We talked about rogue DHCP servers. And then there were the countermeasures. Be careful. Implement some basic security measures on your uh, network and verify the status of your VPN and use a VPN if you have one. It's a very, very brief summary. Then there's the Network Hacking 201, which is still basic networking, networking hacks and countermeasures. Then we were talking about zeros, we were talking about heroes, we were talking about switches, routers, hack switch, hack routers, and we even had a putty session on, on screen. I'm not going to uh, go into the, the, the zeros here. They already had their own musical here on Hacker Hotel. But I'm going to uh, leave them here to make sure that the time frame of the presentation is a bit known. Basically, then everybody had Rian van Rijbroek in their slide deck in one way or another. So this more or less dates the hacking network 201. The people on the right, they still bear naming the most the lady over here is Radia Perlman, inventor of the spanning tree protocol and one of the most important uh, people in inventing uh, part of the LAN network protocol. The guy on the right is someone to be proud of. He's from the Netherlands. Edsger Dijkstra, inventor of the shortest path first algorithm used in OSPF. So we were talking about spanning tree and OSPF in this one. How to hack them and a couple of mitigating measures. For example, have a proper design, multi chassis ether channel, root guard, and if you want to add extra sec uh, security in the form of authentication, 802.1x is a mitigating measure. Then look at uh, possible alternatives for spanning tree protocol. The TRIL, uh, shortest path bridging, VXLAN, and the most important part is training. Make sure that the people who are responsible for managing the network have received proper training, so they know the protocol, they know the best practices, they know the equipment, they know the design, make sure they know what they're talking about. Then there's logging, and logging is only as useful as you uh, if ever use it. So not only log everything, but read them. That does not mean you have to read through every single line, automate or uh, make sure that you start looking at the most important ones or the one that occurs the most uh, of the time. And there's uh, another couple of security features like port security and BPDU guard. But mitigating measures, uh, design 802.1x. Okay, this workshop will be hacking 802.1x. Have I been lying to you? Why would I recommend implementing it as, an, uh, as a security measure? Well, I'm now going to show you how it can be broken. Well. A good security consists of many layers. That means if, there's, if a security uh, gets breached, but it takes a lot of time, if you put enough uh, of them uh, in your network, 
you're probably safer than your next door neighbors. As the previous uh, scenarios, we're going to st uh, uh, as the previous presentation, we're going to start with a nice scenario. But from the coffee shop, we went to a small enterprise. We're now going to a bit more high visibility enterprise. You're on a campus with decent networking in place, with a security team, regular audits, uh, the best practices, even pen testing is performed every now and again. Raising the bar here. What could possibly go wrong? As I said just before, the target audience for this particular presentation is not more or less people responsible for a network in which way or another, but we're also going to look at different roles. For example, what could hackers do? What could pen testers do? And for all of you who don't know, pen testers are good guys, but they're trying the techniques of the bad guys. So there are bits, bit, bits of things you may have to do. But one of the things you should not do is to make sure that you amp up security specifically for pen testers, because you're only deceiving yourself then. What could possibly go wrong? Let's start with the basics. With a company like the scenario we have here, it's probably reasonable to assume that a proper network design is in place. It's not out of the box plugged in and it works and then and don't touch it. Probably also has a, a decent security design. And uh, given the scope and amount of work and money that the company put in, there's probably also proper maintenance and management. And if they hire pen testers, they're probably a reasonable security conscious company. It might be a company with their crown jewels, their data, want to have it heavily protected. It might be a financial, it might be in healthcare. Who knows? Everything is applicable to all of those companies. Then there's the love-hate relationship between 802.1x and pen testers. And a question that was asked uh, multiple times during the years by pen testers, oh, can you please disable your network access control, your 802.1x, so we can stop wasting time trying to bypass it and get to the meat of the situation. Oh, never mind, we'll just use the printer network cable and it doesn't usually have 802.1x. These days it's on one end, it's easier to negate the impact of 802.1x, and on the other hand, it's still a b an extra hurdle to bridge. Don't worry, we'll get back to the printers. Let's start with the basics. The term has been nam named a number of times. What is it? It's an IEEE standard. Uh, it has it was started in uh, 2001 for the first iteration for wired network security. Uh, 2004 uh, wireless was added and there was a later version in 2010. It defines EAPOL, which is the abbreviation for Extensible Authentication Protocol over LAN. And it uses radius on the back end. It's very, very old. Uh, there is some dial-up in the RADIUS abbreviation. That's how old this technology is. can be used in wired and wireless networks, and it's authentication only. It doesn't implement any encryption, any additional security is authentication only for the accessing of the network. It can be expanded, but in essence, 802.1x is authentication only. In the basis, it's a very simple protocol. It describes three roles. A supplicant, an authenticator, and an authentication server. Don't worry, this is a lot of text. I have pictures. A basic architecture looks like this. There are devices who want to access the network, whether it's a mobile device, a computer, or a printer, or a network camera, or whatever. It's going to connect to a wireless, ex uh, a wireless access point or a wired access switch. When a client knocks on the door for the switch, a, the cable gets connected and a link comes up. The switch doesn't allow anything but one thing. It's completely unauthenticated. It drops every single packet that you send to it, except extensible authentication protocol over LAN frames. Those are the only ones that are allowed when the switch port is unauthenticated. 
There's no IP here yet. It will come afterwards. If you, after you authenticate, DHCP kicks in, you get an IP address, you have an IP network. At the very beginning, you don't have an IP networking here. So all of the other stuff that was in the previous presentations about our poisoning and DH, rogue DHCP servers, it doesn't even work because it's not allowed. If it's not EAP OL, it gets dropped as soon as it hits the first network device. The part behind here is an IP network. The, the policy server uh, it serves as an authentication server. It can be local, it can be remote, it can be a, a hundred kilometers away. There's an IP network in between, it'll probably work. And after that, it, the, uh, the credentials supported, uh, supplied by the device get checked against some sort of truth and database. It might be local, it might be remote. But the roles that are part of the standard are supplicant, authenticator, and authentication server. What should happen is either the supplicant or the authenticator starts the authentication process. It can be the supplicant says, hey, I want to authenticate. Or it can be the switch that says, okay, who are you? Then there's some sort of negotiation. On the front end, it's simple Ethernet frames for EAP OL. On the back end, it's the same EAP information encapsulated in the RADIUS protocol, encapsulated in IP, going towards the authentication server. When the entire negotiation is done, the authentication server says yes or no. And then if the answer is no, the switch port, in case of a switch port, will remain unauthenticated and nothing will go through unless something else happens. If it's a success, then you get full access to the network, then DHCP kicks in, etc., etc., etc. You can enhance this as much as you want. You can say, oh, if you're that user, you're going to put in another VLAN, or we're going to implement some additional security controls, or you've got some nice quality of service because you're on the board of directors, and that means your video wants that, uh, that, uh, that are, or <laughs> whichever. Those can be pushed towards the authenticator, the, the switch in most cases, but it's not really part of the 802.1x standard because it's about authentication only. All additions, whether it's posture assessment, make sure antivirus is up to date, is an add-on to that. <coughs> this one's for him. <laughs> this is how short this negotiation on a packet level actually looks like. It's done in no time. It's very brief. It's usually just a couple of seconds. After that, authentication is done, and data is able to flow freely. This is going to be a very interesting slide. <laughs> because what I said before has to be taken with a grain of salt. EAP, Extensive Authentication Protocol, is not really a protocol. It's more like a framework. It has a couple of standards it has to meet. You have to provide a number of information. You have to provide something. You have to adhere to certain standards. But it's, it's extensible. If you want to roll your own, I think you can. But there are many, many different flavors of uh, extensible authentication protocol. Most of them are quite old, like the MD5 one. It's, 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 it can be hacked by a dictionary attack. It's really old. It's really vulnerable, and uh, cracking, brute force cracking can be done in a feasible time at that. Uh, the multiple flavors here, I'm not going through each and every one of them. Some use certificates, some don't. It, it basically means the more complex it is to set up, the more secure it should become if it gets set up properly. <laughs> and <laughs> Exactly. So it, it takes a bit more time and effort to make sure that you pick the right one and make sure it's secure, but it's only as good as the implementation. If you make mistakes during implementation, you might have a decent EAP standard for your 802.1x, but you may sti still uh, be vulnerable for things like this. And there are many of them. There are a number of well-known vulnerabilities in the protocol. Because like I said, in the front end part, it's not uh, 
IP, so the, the, all the usual uh, suspects in IP hacking, like arsenic poisoning and stuff like that, is of no use. But it's still Ethernet. One of the first, suc uh, first successful attacks was uh, done during a hub. It's a very old technology. It works on a layer one of the OZ model, which means physical uh, uh, data and bits only. It literally deals with bits only, and it doesn't do th funny stuff like, oh, that's a MAC address. It doesn't know what a MAC address is. Using a hub, it's possible to make sure that an authenticated device on a certain switch port with a hub in between makes sure the switch uh, transitions from authenticated to active, and everyone connected to the hub can then interact with the rest of the network. There are a bunch of downsides, but if you're, it, it really depends on the purpose of, of the exercise of what you're trying to do. A hub may be sufficient. And it doesn't even matter which flavor of um, EAP you're using. The important part is you're uh, you're trying to live with the um, authentication protocol and make sure on with a proper device on the same network port and it transitions to a proper state and it's done. Um, a couple of improvements can be made, for example, uh, if a switch port sees multiple uh, MAC addresses, it usually authenticates a single MAC address and not other MAC addresses that can pop, uh, uh, pop in through that port. In the very beginning of the uh, implementation, that was not the case. It was simply a port is allowed on the network or a port is not allowed on the network. Logoff frames are in clear text, and they do not contain data matching the initial exchange. That means that if you're on the hub and you flood logoff frames, it's a denial of service from the legitimate client. But there's another denial of service attack for this situation possible. Radius may be an old protocol, but depending on sizing and scaling, if you have 10,000 of clients, your server can get uh, heavy. If you're forwarding all sorts of traffic to watch your radius server, it's a denial of service on the radius server. That means the radius server does not ha have the opportunity to answer to legitimate requests. And that means legitimate requests don't get handled and the port stays unauthenticated, clients, legitimate clients cannot uh, uh, connect to the network. Then there's of course MAC spoofing. It's also usable for hub, then you can send some traffic, but not very much, not very well. Uh, there was a, a target attack uh, for the uh, well-known vulnerabilities, it's called Marvin, it's a tool, don't worry, I'll be crediting at the end of the presentation. It's written in Java and it, it's a proof of concept tool to make sure that you can actually live on the same network in between the supplicant and the authenticator and bridge the legitimate traffic to and from and maybe have some sort of small access to the network based on that port. A well-known vulnerability, I already named it. It's very difficult to implement a proper solution. It's also very expensive. There are, of course, free, uh, uh, free radius servers, but when you have a Cisco, Ars, Aruba, ClearPass, just name them, those are expensive and have a headcount. So the larger your network, the more you're going to pay. And there's, of course, the everlasting curse of the 802.1x implementation. MAC address bypass. Not all devices have a supplicant. Most dramatic are usually the printers. Uh, some cameras, uh, a pixie boot is something that is not uh, uh, po always possible using an 802.1x supplicant. And this process automation, usually equipment that got, got put into place 20 years ago, and it has an expected lifetime of 30, so it's going to be here for a while. There's also a, a hidden trap in here. Because nowadays, some printers do have an 802.1 supplicant. You mean, that's why the first slide I said, oh, never mind, we use the printer port. First, I see a lot of places that the printer is in the same subnet as the client. It's not always practical, but I see it a lot. If you segment the printer off and put it in its separate network, uh, it's usually much better, and it is less of use for, for example, a pen tester. But on the other hand, if you have an 802.1x capable printer, you may actually allow it to join the workflow and then it doesn't matter as much that it gets 
uh, the, the put into a separate network or not. On the other hand, we also talked about peep and eep and leap and other flavors. If the printer department, you is usually facility management and not part of IT for some reason, gets told by IT it has to support, support 802.1x, then it's a check a, a checkbox. Yes, it supports it. I have the spec sheet right here. Okay, but which flavors of the extensible authentication protocols are supported? Well, you never ask me any of that. It's supported. Look, it's a check in the box. And then you may have another situation on your hand when printers can support it, but not at the level you want. I'm not going too much detail on this one, because we are, we are mainly talking about wired attacks. There's, of course, wireless attacks that's also possible. The one on the bottom left, I mentioned during previous ones, the Pineapple. It's a rogue access point that has a number of extremely useful tools. The one I was personally most impressed with was SSL strip. That means you go to an, a, a page that has a, a certificate, and SSL on the back end still has the encrypted site, and it presents to the browser the unencrypted site. And basically, every username, password, or whatever you send over it is clear text and can be locked, interpreted, whatever, by the pineapple. It's local. The version now, I believe, is looking much nicer with more antennas and probably more processing powers and more throughput. It's a very simple device. It's relatively cheap, and it can perform extremely well in less secure setups, for example, the pre-shed keys. The one on the top right, well, which I don't know a single hacker who wouldn't like to get his hands on this one. It looks like a watch, it looks like a smartwatch, and it can do wireless deauthentication attacks. You mainly select the network and say, yes, start now, and it's going to send D out frames, kicking each other off the network. And they're cheap as... The for the, uh, the hacker on the budget, AliExpress, this one is uh, about 20 euros. It's nothing. You might have to wait a couple of weeks for it. Don't you have a marvelous piece of equipment? And, and, and Pentas is usually have <laughs> the even less conspicuous one because it looks rather nice. Uh, it still looks like a, a bit weird. And there's the what you can use for a wire detect. Then now it gets interesting because form factors are a thing. If you need a bit more power and throughput. You can use an Intel NUC, it's still reasonably small, you can easily st uh, stash it away, and it probably has the, um, th the processing power to not uh, increase latency, uh, and it allows for a certain throughput that it can actually be used. There are also are things like plug computer or even compute sticks, about this size with a couple of USB necks, make sure you pick the right one, not every one of them uh, supports promiscuous mode. And don't forget the callback. The uh, attacks that were done way back in 2005, 2010, in those times, cellular modems were rather expensive. So it was really not an option, and having a third network card, where are you going to stick it? It probably was more uh, widely used to have uh, a, a, an AP there that's transmitting its own signal to the hacker in the parking lot, and allowing access to the bridge is basically what it becomes now, uh, into the system. Uh, and, but it's also possible, if you're very careful, to have the callback done in line towards the authenticated switch port. But the chances are you're going to trigger some other attack. Let's make things clear. This is a physical attack factor only. Well, it depends. The hacker is supposed to be nearby, and the place of the hacker is between the supplicant and authenticator. So it can basically not intercept the extensive authentication protocol, but allow that one to go through so the switch port gets actually authenticated. And when it's authenticated, the hacker is also going to make use of that authenticated port for every nefarious thing he wants to do, or pen tester, or whichever. You're going to run in a couple of challenges then. There's switchboard security. If you're going to mess around a bit and your uh, NUC sends its own MAC address instead of the client behind it, switchboard security kicks in. If you have a security conscious company, it's a manual action and it gets locked and alerted and someone's going to look at it and say, what's this then? 
and it'll cost you your NUC. <laughs> so switch port security is something to take into account. ARP is also to, uh, something to take into account. Because if additional measures are taken, and uh, some sort of weird ARPing is observed by whichever intrusion detection system, intrusion prevention system, whichever, you might trigger on-site security. Again, depending on the level of security the company has implemented. A good company can do a lot, but it can't do anything because budgets will skyrocket very fast. It's an exponential growth. That's the thing of routing. For example, the client is supposed to be operational. Or otherwise, if it it's not going to remain on the network port for very long. Well, that's not a really big problem, because if the port is authenticated and the clients disconnect, the hacker device is still connected to the switchboard. As long as they are linked, the switchboard, depending on the setup, design, configuration, etc., does not re-authenticate that often. It might, it might not. But if you set it to re-authenticate every um, uh, five minutes or so, if you have a large, extensive campus of, of uh, 20,000 users, it's going to generate a lot of traffic, and you're going to need a very beefy radius server for that. So timers are usually set a bit less strict, but it might kick in. Then uh, is the, uh, the uh, callback traffic. If you want to initiate traffic from the rogue device, either towards the client or towards the net rest of the network, you're going to need an IP address. If things like the NARMPIC ARP inspection are implemented, you know the IP address because it lives on the client, and we have to want to use it from the hacker device as well. You have to do some clever trickery. I see, I forgot one of the most interesting ones here. Uh, this setup is usually built upon a Linux bridge. Linux bridge has been around for a while, and it has changed quite a lot. At the very beginning, Linux bridging dropped EAP OL traffic was actually a kernel package to make it, I think, most more secure and more up to the standard. But people who want to utilize this, let's call them pen testers for the sake of uh, they're the good guys, they found out and they found out they could roll back a kernel patch, which could add problems later, or do some other trickery. Well, they did both. And I think part of the uh, Linux bridging uh, now lives in uh, user space, and it's much easier to circumvent this uh, shortcoming. And it's actually possible to relatively easy allow EAP OL traffic to flow through a wireless bridge instead of it getting dropped, which is usually the, d the default. So a lot of smart people have done a lot of s uh, smart things. That's why I added a credit slide at the end of this presentation, because without all of their findings, this would be a much shorter talk. So one of the challenges is wide case use, uh, wide use case. Then there's the pen tester. If it's going towards the desk of, for example, a secretary who is going for lunch, and he's going to need an hour to set it up, chances are the, uh, the pen tester gets ex uh, uh, gets spotted and escorted out of the building. So usually it's drop and leave and don't touch. You usually don't have the time to fully configure it. Sometimes you get lucky. Uh, you, you do some dumpster diving, you find a printout with the configuration settings of the printer, including MAC addresses, IP addresses, gateway, etc. It all depends. And there's automation. Uh, one of the experts, who I will credit at the end of the presentation, did some automation and their bridge started down in a down state. That means no traffic. Then it gets brought up, then it sniffs a couple of, of packets, it actually gets the information it needs from the first packets, then it uh, reconfigures its own network bridging configuration with it, restarts, and then uses those parameters. So the, uh, there's automation for the win. Then there's the phoning home. You can, for some reason, allow some traffic in towards a running SSH server. You can see what traffic out is, or you can use a cellular or Wi-Fi modem on the back. It all has its ups and downs. Uh, if you don't have close access to the device, Wi-Fi is probably out. Um, the phone home uh, inline uh, or uh, dial back is usually a bit problematic because a uh, callback in uh, from outside to inside, it's rather rare to see inbound traffic allowed towards workstations, and for good reason, 
usually some internal hosts are allowed to communicate with workstations, for example, there's the, the management platform uh, for mostly Windows environment. Um, th those are pro usually allowed, but from outside from internet, no, forget it. And phone home traffic that is initiated by the hacker device also runs into a chance to get seen by firewall. Ooh, they think it's con uh, command and control traffic. They think it's, it might be a bot. Uh, they think it's passing through a web proxy. It gets ho hosted to uh, um, a machine generated DNS name. There are all sorts of reasons that it might attract attention. So it really depends on what is the purpose of the probe. Do you want it to sniff traffic? Do you want to try and initiate an SSL traffic? Do you want to breach the host and make sure that there's an entry point there? And there's also many, many ways to prevent against any of this, but it's going to get expensive. In a nutshell, all of these types of traffic depend on passing through EAP OL traffic through the Linux bridge between the actual client and the switch port. What's another easy way when this uh, setup doesn't work? Well, the workstation stays empty for the day. There's a whole day without a switch port getting authenticated. You do need a legitimate client. It's not the end of the slide, but first, the credits I mentioned. There's a couple of people who did some talks at DEF CON that were a major inspiration to this talk. If you want to know more in depth about it, I should just, just take a picture of the slide. Go find them. The, the movies are on YouTube. There's something between 45 minutes and 60 uh, and one and a half hours or something. And they really go in depth into the, uh, the matter. Also have uh, some demonstrations, some more successful than others. It's one of the other reasons I usually don't demo, because the demo guys hate me. Uh, there's uh, Gabriel Solstice Ryan, who uh, did an excellent presentation on a decent tool. Alva Duckwell uh, wrote one of the best functioning uh, probes. He's actually working as a pen test and he developed his own tool, including the automation I mentioned. Uh, there's Valerian uh, Legrand. He's the creator of Fenris, uh, sorry, Fenrir, one of the uh, most recent uh, 802.1x uh, tooling. I'll go step aside. I can see a couple of people using a camera. There's uh, D. Steik, an ESP enthusiast uh, who is responsible for uh, making the basis of that awesome watch you saw. Uh, Paf Trinos did a, a wonderful uh, presentation on 802.1x, how to secure it and how to, uh, uh, watch, watch, what to watch for uh, to, uh, to spot breaking and uh, easily uh, to hack stuff. And that's Mike Seaman. He was the only name I found for the IEEE with relations to the creation of 802.1x. There might be more, but I wasn't able to find them within five minutes and then I got bored. Okay, a lot of people, especially management, don't want to see this one. It's a couple of harsh truths. It will cost a lot. It will cost even more if you're up against a state actor. Most of the people here in the room, aside if you're working for the Dutch government, you're going to fit in the first category, there's budget constraints, and chances are you'll be up against a state actor are a bit uh, higher than for the average enterprise. Keep in mind, shit will happen. Maxis Authentication Bypass is a famous one. Like I said, it supports 802.1x, but doesn't support the right 802.1x implementation. Cameras are also um, uh, an attack point because they usually are an afterthought, and they're usually not even part of the facility management procurement process, they're usually part of the security process. And most security companies, especially when it's concerning physical security, they don't know a thing about networking, except, hey, this is a network camera, I need network. And whether where or not it gets plugged in, oh, I just need outside internet, it's managed from the cloud. <sighs> I have stories to tell you, never mind those. Um, in, in short, they usually um, uh, depend on an extremely high amount of ports going to outside, usually to a cloud instance here. You can't even uh, uh, limit the amount of destination IP addresses because it's the cloud. <laughs> you blink an eye, DNS get rerouted, and it needs to, to go to another IP address. Having a better lock than your neighbors does help for a while. If you're up to speed, you have decent security in place, you're on a large uh, terrain with lots of uh, facilities, lots of buildings. 
you limit your uh, Wi-Fi from uh, not going too far outside of the building. Uh, you don't have that many crown jewels that are digital. For example, they're physical and uh, are locked uh, tight. It's also a thing that may help postpone you getting hacked for a while. At a certain point of time, you're, uh, if you're not keeping up, you become the, the, um, the target that people will do, need to do the least amount of effort for to get the best results. And this also doesn't help uh, for the preparation, it helps afterward. Prepare to be hacked. Just make sure that you know what to do if you get hacked. Sure, it's a bit unpredictable, but you can think of it beforehand. You can have playbooks. Someone got domain admin. Uh, someone breached our Wi-Fi. Someone took off with a server. All of those things, you can think of them beforehand. You can write playbooks. You can review the play playbooks every once in a while. You can dream up more playbooks. You can deviate from playbooks. He says, this looks very much like playbook five, but with a small twist. Fine, we'll grab the playbook, we're going to adapt as we go, but we do have a solid basis. There are, fortunately, some mitigating measures. One of them is design, network segmentation. For example, the printer port I mentioned, if all your printers are on a separate network with only allowing access from the printer spooler to the printer, you're in good shape. Of course, it doesn't ma it work that way because there's some process automation who needs a direct IP address for the printer in order to print the daily reports. So you need, and where is it located? Oh, it's located in that subnet. So it's usually get brought up a bit. Then there's the training and user security awareness. If users know that there shouldn't be a knock under their desk, <laughs> and if people are told it could be a tech, if you see something odd, report it as soon as you can. Don't wait until after lunch. Lunch can wait. User awareness, especially this being a mostly physical attack, the reason I set an asterisk there was Wi-Fi, there's also a Wi-Fi point of view, and with good antennas you can be a long time off, but still be somewhat vulnerable to this attack. Th is in, in essence, it's still a physical attack. You can't attack someone uh, from 100 kilometers away, but you probably can uh, pull it off 100 meters away. This is, um, training security awareness, it's a very important one, especially facility management and other people who purchase equipment that gets plugged into the network. Either it gets completely segmented off without any exception, for example, the printer situation or the IP camera situation or whatever situation, or it's going to adhere to the standards that were set up, implemented, regularly re reviewed, uh, updated and tested, and then you can get usually can get away with the proper implementation. And there it is again, logging and reading them. You don't need to see every time a switch port goes up or down, but if switch port security kicks in, or a probe, or your uh, Ethernet monitoring, or your network management solution, or your ITS or I IDS or IPS kicks in, you may want to look at it. And you may want to look at it fast. It doesn't mean every company should have their own SOC, your their own security operations center, but if you're important enough, it might not hurt. Uh, then there's uh, multiple security types and layered security. If you have a building that everyone can walk into and you have a door, for example, like this one, with a large gap, I can see some room for improvements. Make sure the security is layered on every level. Make sure not uh, everyone can enter uh, the building or gets close to the network equipment, gets close to uh, users, because this is an attack that can perfectly be done without even seeing the switch. You just need, need to go somewhere that's between uh, users and switch. And whether that's a cable tree or a, a wiring closet uh, or a, a satellite equipment room, if you're in between, then you have something to that you can pull off. Physical security is remarkably uh, important for physically based attacks. And then there's, of course, the layered security. If you have 802.1x, it doesn't substitute 
all the other things of security you can do. There's the port security, there's access control list, there's firewalling, there's IDS tires, IPS. It usually is a combination of all these things that make a network more secure. Then there's tunneling. It's also, I want to uh, point back to the very first one, design. I see it uh, done by a lot of companies these days. They say all our clients are entrusted. We're going still going to isolate them from each other, but they get internet access or they get allowed to initiate an SSL VPN with multi-factor authentication. So we're not uh, even going to bother with 802.1x. And the only thing it's allowed to do is initiate an SSL VPN and then there's nothing going to and from the wired or wireless networking <laughs> that you can do anything about because it's usually encrypted, especially when coupled with proper certificate management. It might be easy to set up a set SSL VPN concentrator than to implement a full-blown uh, 802.1x implementation. It all depends. Then there's, of course, the behavioral uh, indication of compromise, uh, which can run as a, an antivirus or whatever product on your workstation, on your server. And it says, why is this client performing a port scan? Why is it trying to start some application I don't want it to, to start? It, it can be as simple as starting a process that's unknown on a workstation. Behavioral indication of compromise. Why is that engineer trying to contact the finance server? All of these can be done on multiple places in the network. It's usually more the more places you want to implement it, the more expensive and complex it's going to be. It's a major part of your total security posture. There's IDS, IPS, maybe even a SOC. And there's, of course, just throw enough money against it and it'll probably limit the chances you get breached. But not everyone is uh, IT at its core business. So there's nothing wrong with getting outside help. Just make sure you have your requirements in order, you know what you want. You make sure that all the relevant people are part of the uh, process uh, and you make sure you go with a dependable organization and you can easily go for outside support for management, uh, security operations center and similar uh, uh, ways to make sure that your network and security uh, posture gets improved without doing every single one yourself, including hiring the people who want to do that. Now for the most intriguing question of them all. Are there any questions? Questions? Sure. Um, you were talking about network access control, which is basically protecting the parameter. In the last uh, list with mitigations, there are going more into processes and into the network and mitigations. Okay, sure. Um, you initially talked about network access control, which is protecting the, pr uh, the premises and the gate around the internal network. And the list of mitigating measures uh, were more about internal segmentation, that one, yeah, tooling, etc. But, but do you see a trend into more um, management on the endpoint, like, for example, uh, centrally managing and also actively uh, the Windows file on endpoints? not only for inbound connections, but also outbound connections. So you can do like a, a bit of micro segmentation centrally managed on the endpoint. Well, I hear two things here. One is, is uh, an, a proper endpoint security, which includes uh, one or another flavor of uh, agent usually, and whether or not it's an antivirus agent or doing more, there are uh, Products that go, I'm not going to, uh, to make this into a commercial or sales uh, pitch, but there are uh, products that do both antivirus and do some behavioral uh, uh, analysis. And they block process pure on it because that you shouldn't do that, and then it really blocks it. Th that's one. It, you should implement it, but depending on a uh, scope, uh, budget, etc., I'm not really at a place to, uh, to advise anything. And micro segmentation uh, can be done, uh, but it, it, it's usually uh, called for as a data center technology. But with a few simple uh, things that you know what to do, uh, you can, for example, use a VLAN access control list in combination with some access control list. And with the VLAN access control list, you make sure that traffic within a VLAN between clients is not allowed. And certain clients only get access to certain other uh, uh, ne uh, networks. And the combination of those two are relatively lightweight. If you design them properly, they sc also scale 
And without even using data center uh, grade equipment, you can still implement micro segmentation at the client level. So it, it really depends. It should be a combination of both a user, age, a user uh, desktop protection and uh, endpoint protection and uh, the network uh, uh, protection. For example, the segmentation, and you can put it back as, as sm small as uh, micro segmentation. So the client is only allowed to talk with the gateway on an Ethernet level and are only allowed to talk to certain servers uh, associated with the function, usually a freelance or function de derived uh, at, at the data center and not anything out of that. In fact, you can even say for if it tries anything else, raise an alert by simply logging anything that it wants to do that's outside of the scope of the design. Thanks. Any more questions? Are you still awake? <laughs> Maybe, uh, one, uh, more. Just a few seconds, please. <laughs> Thanks. Maybe an odd one, but we shouldn't forget our uh, least, uh, least thought but most uh, used uh, networks, our home networks. What can we do? Well, aside from me and a few colleagues, we don't have 802.1x implemented. <laughs> um, what you can do... Um, the, the, the bad thing, news I have, the best you can do is also training. So make sure you know what to buy, you know how to use it. And when you, you usually ha don't have uh, many millions in digital uh, data uh, located at your home, at least I hope not. But the solution should fit the purpose. And for a home network, the, the, the bar usually isn't as high as for the scenario company I placed at the beginning of this presentation. But uh, open Wi-Fi is usually a bad idea. Uh, Pre-shared key is probably best used. Uh, it's the small things. I mean, we're all hackers here. Uh, so if you have a, a sign in your hallway that's readable from outside with your Wi-Fi password, it's probably not a good idea. But if you can have it as far as best as and the at the inside of your front door to make sure it's not visible from the outside, but it's still easily available for people putting down their jackets, oh, that's the Wi-Fi password. Um, another good one, of course, is uh, not to make it too difficult, but also not make it too easy. So no reuse, no make it welcome. Um, maybe change it uh, a couple of times a year. What's the worst that could happen? That people need to uh, ask for the Wi-Fi password when they visit you again. It's usually the small stuff that prevents the, the big hassle. Um, this is also a, a specifically aimed at accessing a network. And usually, except when you're doing a LAN party, most of the access uh, on, the, um, uh, on a home network is done by Wi-Fi. And uh, quite a few solutions now also support guest networks that allow for internet access, but no access to your uh, local NAS or uh, whatever. So make sure what you're doing, think about it, uh, do a bit of research, and then just implement the best traffic. And of course, what everybody keeps telling here, especially from an IoT point of view, uh, keep the stuff updated. It's sometimes it's as simple, as simple as that. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any more questions? No. Then I would like you to uh, thank you for everyone for attending here. I didn't really expect such a massive turnout. Thank you for that, and enjoy the rest.